Well, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Monday Night Calculus. My name is Steve Kokoska. I'm joined this evening by my good friend and colleague, Tom Dick, who is in the Pacific Northwest. And substituting for Curtis Brown this evening is Allison, who is in the great state of Texas. She'll be monitoring the chat tonight. Um, if you have any uh, questions on anything that we present tonight or any other question related to AB Calculus, please put that in the chat and Allison will try to get those questions to us. Tonight we're talking about one of my favorite topics. We're going to talk about improper integrals first, and then we're going to do a little bit with series. I really enjoy this topic of improper integrals uh, because for a couple of reasons. It brings together a lot of different ideas, I think, and also because some of the results just seem counter counterintuitive, uh, but they are correct mathematically. So I think we've got some good problems tonight, some great technology examples. So let's see if we can take a look at a couple of these. I'm going to share my screen, Tom, to get going if I can. Here we go. Can you see that one, Tom? Yeah, it looks great, Steve. All right. So in, in number one, we're going to try to evaluate each of these integrals or show that they are uh, divergent. And this first one is a good one. There are lots of little things going on here. Tom, don't let me miss anything. Uh, this is an integral from 1 to infinity, the log of x divided by x to the fourth. Now, the very first thing is that if a student were presented with some a problem like this, especially on the free response portion of the exam, they have to recognize that this is an improper integral. The responsibility is theirs. They have to see that this is an infinite interval and know how to solve this one. So the first thing they have to do is to recognize this. Then the second thing they have to do, in my opinion, is they have to recognize that this is solving this is a two-step process. They really have to evaluate a definite integral and simplify as much as possible. And then they have to evaluate a limit. Now, they can do that in two separate pieces. In this particular problem, I'm going to do it sort of all in one. But it's certainly OK to go off to the side and solve the definite integral and simplify and then come back and do a limit. And one other little thing here, uh, one other mistake that we, we see once in a while from students is that in evaluating the limit, they often try to treat infinity as a number, a number that you can add and subtract and divide and multiply. And you can't do that here. Remember that that's a symbol. That's a symbol that indicates behavior. And you can't multiply and add and divide with that symbol. So the very first thing I thought about is, well, how the heck am I going to find an antiderivative of this expression? And the very first thing I thought about was a simple substitution with u equal to the log of x. But just thinking out loud about that, the derivative of that is 1 over x. And I've got that, but I've got a lot of extra stuff left over. I've got an extra x cubed left in the denominator. So it doesn't seem like that's going to work. So it turns out that the technique that we need to use here to find an antiderivative is integration by parts. And that doesn't seem quite right, but integration by parts is going to work here because and this is kind of a common technique, a common problem solving technique. If we let u be equal to the log of x, the derivative of that is one over x. And we've sort of got rid of that transcendental function. So if I let u be the log of x, there's du. dv is what's left over. And I can integrate that as sort of this backwards power. That's minus 1 divided by 3x cubed. OK, I'm going to put all of this together with the definition of a type 1 improper integral. So again, the first thing is I recognize that this is improper. So this is the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to b. And here you can kind of, I think, clearly see these two steps. I've got to figure out this definite integral and simplify as much as possible. And then the second thing I need to do is evaluate that limit. Well, all right. Let's see. Integration by parts. This is going to be u v let's see u times v there it is u times v there's the minus sign log of x in the numerator divided by 3x cubed now there's several different ways that i might be able to denote this 
I chose to do this in kind of gory detail so that we could see everything that's going on here. So this is the limit as B goes to infinity of U times V. There it is. Plus, it's going to be a plus is minus the integral of V du, but there's a minus sign in here, so this becomes a plus. 1 to B, multiplying these two expressions together, that's 1 divided by 3x to the 4. Well, I'm lucky here. It turns out that integration by parts is going to work here. What's well, a good choice? Because this remaining integrand, I can find an antiderivative for that. I can bring the one third outside, and that's just x to the minus 4. And that's just a common antidifferentiation rule. So then antiderivative becomes minus 1 divided by 9x cubed. I still haven't executed or taken care of the limit, so you'll notice that those two expressions are still there. I haven't done the limit, so I still need to drag that symbol along. Now what I'm going to do is plug in the upper bounds here and the lower bounds and subtract in both of these expressions. Let's take a look at this first one. Plugging in the b, I've got the minus log b divided by 3b cubed. What happened to the 1? Well, when I subtract off, when I plug in a 1 for x, I've got a log of 1, which is 0. So that second term is just 0 divided by 3, so that drops out. So that's gone. And let's see what happens here now. Let's see. This is going to be... Plus, well, what I did is I took the minus sign and brought it outside to make this just a little bit easier for me. Plugging in the upper bound, 1 divided by 9b cubed, plugging in the lower bound of 1 minus 1 ninth. Now I've got to try to take the limit. Hmm. Well, let's do the easy parts first. The limit of a constant is pretty easy. That's just 1 ninth. Notice there's a minus and a minus here, so that's going to become a plus one nine. What about this expression? What happens as b increases without bound? Well, the numerator is constant at one. The denominator is increasing without bound, so that's driving the whole fraction to zero. So there's a minus zero there. This is the tougher one. What's going on here? Hmm. Well, as b increases without bound, the log of b is going off to infinity. As b increases without bound, 3b cubed is going off to infinity. So neglecting the minus sign here, this is infinity over infinity. This is an indeterminate form. Told you there was a lot of little things going on here. So this is just a good aside here, just to remind people as we get really close to the exam, how they have to deal with a L'Hopital's problem. Now, Tom, I think, would agree with this. In the context of an improper integral, if a student reached this point, normally these kinds of problems are worth three points. And if a student reached this point in the problem and just went from this expression to zero, I'm going to guess that they would receive full credit. There might be a fourth point in here for demonstrating how to get this limit indicating that they used L'Hopital. Not sure, because there's a lot of extra things going on here. But how do you do this one? Well, let's bring this off to the side and take a look at the limit as b goes to infinity of the log of b divided by 3b cubed. As b goes to infinity, once again, the numerator is going to infinity. The denominator is going to infinity. You can recognize that, but remember, students, um, we don't want to write infinity over infinity like that. Now, we know we can't write in other indeterminate forms. We know we can't write equals zero over zero. I don't know how the chief reader would respond to something like this. I'm guessing that they would not accept that. We haven't seen one like that, I, I don't believe. So what I would suggest is you should take a look at each limit individually. The log of b is going to infinity as b increases without bound. And the limit as b goes to infinity of 3b cubed is equal to infinity. And if I had a little bit more room down here at the bottom, I might write something like, therefore, this original limit is in an indeterminate form 
of infinity over infinity. And therefore, I can apply L'Hopital's rule. Tom, I'm going to try something a little fancy here and see if the eraser works. Hey, how about that? Hey, Steve, we've got a, a quick question. Uh, sure. Mark Corrali, our friend, has uh, mentioned that somebody on the Facebook um, group has asked about what if somebody wrote the limit as B approaches positive infinity from the left? Ooh. And to be honest, I don't think I've ever seen that in all my years of reading. Okay. I'd be hard pressed to take off for it because I think yeah. that <laughs> it's not incorrect, but it's an interesting question. <laughs> so, I don't know what your feelings on it. Well, let me ask you a, a question first. Okay. What if a student write B going to infinity from the right? Well, now I'd be now I'd have a real problem with that. Okay, so I'm here's sure my... there's much room over there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you have a problem with that one, I'm going to say I have a problem with coming from the left. Yeah. I mean, I understand the logic, but yeah. uh, I I don't think we'd take off for it. But right. Let's yeah. let's not. Let's not have our students write that. Let's not right. encourage yeah. that. How about that? <laughs> and uh, Mark also adds that, uh, you know, uh, a point has been taken off if students use infinity in any arithmetic expression. Is it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's just not. Yep. They're, they're very uh, strict about that. So, yeah. Yeah. In fact, that's part of my uh, I'm not quite through all of this. And I have do have an example of that here. So, yeah. Yep. We'll demonstrate that. Thanks, Mark. And uh, can you stand one more, Steve? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the uh, some folks study relative rates of growth of things like powers of x versus exponentials yeah. or the logarithm. And so uh, could that kind of justification be used for that natural log of b or 3b cubed? Somebody could just say, well, that a power is going to grow faster than the I know that the power grows faster than the law, therefore uh, that's going to go to zero or something like that. Yeah, in my opinion, I'd accept that. Absolutely. But, but I, I don't know how uh, at the reading, I don't know if that would be, I, my guess is would be in the midst of, of a problem like this would be no problem. Yep, agreed. Uh, if they were asked for a justification for a limit, then I think they would need to go further. Yeah. I think I agree with that. Yeah. Great. All right. I'm going to try to apply L'Hopital's rule here. So this is a limit. As B goes to infinity, let's see, that's going to be 1 divided by B. I've taken the derivative of the numerator, divided by 3 times 3, 9B squared. And this is a good example to show that you need to simplify this first. And I won't go through, I don't think I have enough room to sneak that in there, but this is the limit as b goes to infinity of 1 divided by 9b cubed, and now that goes to 0. Um, to Mark's other point, Tom, I think you and I have seen this at the reading. I think I might focus in on this term just for a minute. We have seen some students write something like this, uh, 1 divided by 9 infinity cubed, and you can't do that. You can't do arithmetic with infinity. And so they would just automatically lose that last point, say that evaluation point. All right, so after all of that, this term does indeed go to zero. This one's going to zero and I'm left with a one ninth. And so indeed this improper integral does converge and it converges to exactly one ninth. And I think with a little bit of luck, I've got a picture or an illustration here down at the bottom. Let me see if I can arrow up a little. And this is the part that's a little counterintuitive to me, but it's kind of cool. There's a graph of y equal to log of x divided by x to the fourth. You'll notice that it does get very close to zero, or it's very close to zero originally, but it gets really close to that x-axis quickly. So this is a region that is a really, I, I think what we usually say, Tom, is of infinite extent but it actually has finite area. We can think of this region as having finite area, which is very interesting. I didn't try this, Tom, but I wonder if we can take that region and revolve it about the x-axis and look for a volume. Who? That's a good problem. 
parade to collect tomorrow morning. You got a little technology on this one? Uh, sure do. Okay. Uh, yeah. There we go. All right. So um, one thing I would mention is that uh, an improper integral type of question, you would just, uh, I, I don't think you'd ever really see it on the calculator open part of the examination. And the reason for that is um, some calculators do have a computer algebra system capability, and this would be just a button push, pushing calculation would be really no analysis at all required to get that value of one ninth, say on a uh, TI Inspire with CAS. So you're, while you're not going to see these on the calculator open part of the exam, uh, when you are working with improper integrals, I just, just wanted to show you that even with a non-CAS machine, you can do things to do kind of a reality check. Um, now, the graph that Steve had up, really nice graph, but I'd be hard pressed to look at that and say, oh yeah, one ninth <laughs> looks reasonable. Yeah. Uh, the biggest reason is even if I did kind of an approximation of the area and say, well, it, it looks like that's plausible. The tail, it's really hard to gauge, you know, how fast that's going to zero. And so the uh, question is, uh, can we do an approximation on the calculator? And the answer is, yeah, it, you really can do a, a fairly decent uh, approximation. So what I'm going to do is um, on the TI-84 here, pull up the math menu and just go ahead and pull up a, an integral. That's number nine down there under the math menu. And there's my nice little integral template. And instead of integrating from one to infinity, on Inspire, I could actually put in the symbol infinity up here. But I'm mm -hmm. just going to put in a relatively large number. Uh, this may not seem that large, but I'm going to put in a thousand. Okay. And then I'll put in the integrand that we were dealing with. And let's see, I think we have a nice little fraction. It's the alpha shift of the xt theta key. There we go. Mm -hmm. And let's see, we had natural log of x upstairs in the fraction and its numerator. Then downstairs in the denominator, we had x to the fourth. See, there we go. I think we got that all right. And we're integrating with respect to x. And so I'm just evaluating a, a proper integral, but it's over a fairly large uh, domain or, or interval here. And uh, I would expect that this really is converging to one ninth, that this value should be reasonably close to one ninth. Mm -hmm. So let's enter that, see what we get. Oh, and if you need to check, do you know if you actually calculate one ninth, but I would hope folks recognize that 0 0.1111 repeating is that. Uh, but let me point out, suppose I got a value here that was bigger than one ninth, just even by a little bit, it's like, it's like 0 0.124, something like that. Well, I would be really concerned because my integrand here is always positive for x greater than zero. So my, the larger my interval is, the more I would be adding on. And so if I'm already getting an answer bigger than a ninth from one to a thousand, one ninth could not be the answer. So, so that would be, but here we, we clearly don't have that that situation so we're okay i don't know if that made sense is that you know you can read because my integrand function is always positive the larger the interval the bigger the area is going to be uh and so the the if i cut it off at any point i should be getting something that's an underestimate of the actual convergent limit value um Okay, and so that's a, a technique that uh, you can do on improper integrals is just try a suitably large integral. Uh, if you had a divergent integral, um, you would expect a, a fairly large result if the integrand was always positive. So that would be maybe not as convincing, but at least would be a tip off that, yeah, if, if you're finding divergence, you should be seeing some kind of divergent behavior. You may want to do a sequence of these. To get a feel for that.
All right, I'll stop the share there and turn it back. Tom, uh, before you okay. leave this, I have sure. two questions. Uh, uh, is it possible to define a, a function where the upper bound is the variable and then just put some values in in the table? That's one thing, one question. So if I wanted to test like, you know, 100 and or 500 and then 1,000, could I get those values in the table and sort of see you know, what's going on? Does it look like it's getting closer to, in this case, one nine? And the second question is, um, I don't know what the technique is, what the numerical technique is for the calculator to evaluate this definite integral. And so let's just suppose, um, I mean, let's just suppose here's this function that's decreasing all the way off to infinity. And I know the calculator isn't doing this, but what if it were using a left-hand Riemann sum? So then it could return a value that's bigger than what I did analytically. Is that true? Now, I know that's not what the calculator does, right? I know, I know right. it's not. Yes. Yeah, so you've got a good point. If you actually are approximating with Riemann sums, yes. your Riemann sums could be larger than the actual value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Because those are going to be, um, well, as, as you said, if it's decreasing, then mm -hmm. a left Riemann sum is going to be an overestimate. Yeah. And, it, and even if you're, truncating it, it may be the, the part that's being overestimated is more than the part you're, you're, you're not calculating. So that's a very good point, yeah. But well, we don't we don't really know how it's doing this in the background. Right. It's a much more sophisticated method than just yeah. Riemann sums, right? Like, okay. What it's actually doing is it's actually uh, uh, partitioning up the interval multiple times uh, and then it increases the size of the partition so it makes it finer. And then uh -huh. it's looking for a sequence of results that are that are close to each other. And gotcha. that's how it's figuring that it's converging. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. So I think, Steve, what you were mentioning could be yes. done. I'm going to take a look and see if I can. Uh, I, I just went to the list menu yeah. and going over to operations. And you see that sequence command there? Let oh, you could do it that way too, perhaps. Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah, I think things. we could use that. Okay. And then your expression, yeah, I'm going to give this a shot, see what happens, is I think okay. I could actually put an integral in there. Okay. Uh, okay, now we've got that fn int right. as we're in this. And so I'd put in like maybe one uh, and then comma, and then I'll, I'll do uh, alpha n. times, uh, let me try 100. And then the expression, which is, and I might have put my arguments in the wrong order. We, we Yeah, I think that, that I thought the integrand the integrand first. go first? I think so. Yeah, so let me go ahead and, I'm so used to using that template. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so let's try the natural log of x. Divided by x to the fourth. Whoops. Whoops, let's see. I need uh, that comma. And now I'm going to go um, from 1 to n times 100. And let's see, the variable of integration is x. Now I'll close that off. So that was that kind of inline way of writing that integral. But now I'm going to let in my variable that's up there in that upper limit. Whoops, let's try that again, alpha n. I'm going to let it run from 1 to 4. And my idea is that's going to generate, I hope, 
Um, oh, you know what? I only needed the expression here. I was uh, yeah, doing a, I think so. a whole bunch of stuff here that I didn't do. So I, I apologize for fumbling around here. So let me delete this part. Okay, so that's just our integral. Okay, so the integral is good. The variable is actually that n that's up in the upper limit. Mm -hmm. And the starting value will be one. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, acting as if this was on the calculated page. All right. And then we'll just step by ones. So my sure. idea is I'm going to integrate from 1 to 100, 1 to 200, yeah. 1 to 300, 1 to 400. I think that was the idea you were yeah. getting yeah. at. And what this does is it actually pastes that expression. And I can see a mistake in there that I've made. So I think I can um, correct that. It should say dx, right? Yeah, I think X is some, is the next argument after the expression. Right. Yeah. So somewhere uh, along the line, I uh, I fouled up there, and so I'm trying to edit that. Yeah, it's going to not like that. So <laughs> I'll go up there. See if we can enter that. Oh, let's see if I can edit it. There we go. Um, in business, I needed to have a DX there. All right, let's see if this works. And hopefully we'll get four values. Calculating four different integrals, I think. Oh, tolerance not met. Okay. Huh. So apologies. Well, it was worth a chance. <laughs> yeah, the, lower, the lower bound was in the wrong spot, too, I think. But that's a... That's oh, okay. I, I apologize. That's what I get for trying to do it on the fly here. So, Well, I, I mean, another way that I was thinking of is just going to the Y equal menu and defining a function where the upper bound is the is the variable. And then go to table. And oh, just yeah, I have to think about that. I'm not... Yeah, I don't know if that would... It's conceivable that, that could work. True. Okay. 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 All right. I'm going to stop the chair. Okay, cool. Turn it back to you. All right. I got another one. Let's see. All right. Let's try part B. So this one looks simple enough. An integral from 0 to 1 of 1 divided by 2 minus 3x dx. And once again, uh, it's the responsibility of the student to look at that and say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, that's an improper integral of type 2. Uh, because the function has an infinite discontinuity at x equal to two thirds. With x equal to two thirds, we get a zero in the denominator. And you know, you you I know the students are familiar with these kinds of problems. We know there's a, a vertical asymptote there. So all right, I've got to split this original integral from zero to one up into two pieces: zero to two thirds plus two thirds to one. I've got to take a look at each piece separately. Both must converge to the original integral to converge. If one diverges, I'm done. The entire integral diverges. So I'm just going to, for the heck of it, start with the definite integral, pardon me, start with the improper integral on the left-hand side here. I'm going to take a look at the integral from 0 to 2 thirds of this expression, and again, I recognize that there is this infinite discontinuity at two thirds. I recognize that this is an improper integral. Usually we call this of type two. So this is a limit as B goes to two thirds. Hey, there's from the left. How about that? Zero to B of this expression. And if Curtis were here, I would ask him how you actually find an antiderivative there. It's almost inspection, Allison. I know you're listening in the background there. But it's really a simple substitution. I'm going to do a little scribbling here with u equal to 2 minus 3x. And so du is equal to minus 3dx. And for those of you who follow Monday Night Calculus, you know that the way that I like to do these is to solve explicitly for dx so that I have a minus du divided by 3 is equal to dx. And so I would change variables here. 
and bring everything into the you world. And remember, if you do that, you've got to drag along the bounds. And we'll see a more explicit example of that in part C. This one is almost inspection. And I know that a lot of you students are very good at this, can look at that and say, hey, well, I know this is a natural log, but I need the derivative of that denominator in the numerator. So I need a minus three up there. So that means to keep everything equal, I need a minus one third out in front. So there it is. So the antiderivative here is minus one third the log of the absolute value of two minus three X. There's the bound zero and B. I have not taken the limit yet. So I'm gonna drag this along. I'm gonna plug in the bound. Let's see, the log of two minus three B minus the log, is that right? Two, yes it is, log of the absolute value of two. And now what's going on here as B goes to two thirds from the left? Well, this is constant. What's happening to this argument, two minus three B? What's happening to that as B goes to two thirds from the left? Well, let's just think about that just a little bit. That argument is actually getting very close to zero. I'm taking the absolute value of that. And so it's getting very close to zero through the positive values. So what's the log doing? Well, the log is going off to, well, minus infinity. Well, okay, there's a minus sign out in front here. The log of two is inconsequential. That's a tiny constant here. And so that's driving this whole limit to increase without bound and going to infinity. So uh, we argue sometimes about this, but we do usually write this limit as equal infinity. Um, we understand that infinity is not a number, but we as mathematicians recognize that kind of notation, notational fluency. We know what that means, that this limit is increasing without bound. So I'm done with this one. I don't even have to look at this second part of this, the second improper integral. This divergence, so that means the entire integral, the one that I started out with, diverges and I'm done. Let me arrow up just a little bit and take a look at this graph. That's what it looks like. And let's see, I guess uh, visually or graphically, I want to know if this region of infinite extent between zero and one has finite area. And in fact, we've just shown that this region over here has infinite area. So the original integral diverges. Pretty cool. Nice problem. Tom, do you have some technology with this one too? Uh, no, Steve. I'll I'll hold Wait off a little bit until you do the next one. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. I like this one. Let's look at the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of dx divided by a holy fleet of 4x squared plus 4x plus 5. Well, I, I did this one in kind of a choppy way, and I apologize for that, it's sort of a couple of different pieces. I wanted to put this one in because I had a discussion with a couple of people about uh, whether or not students need to know how to complete the square. Is that a technique of integration that they really need to know how to do? And yes, they do. So this is a good problem as you prepare for the exam. How do you just solve this? How do you just solve this indefinite integral? Well, the technique here is to take a look at that denominator and complete the square in that polynomial. How do you do that? Well, here's a way that I attack these, and I know that, Tom, you may have a different way, a better way of doing this. I'm going to keep the 4x squared and the 4x together. I'm going to put the plus 5 over here. What do I need to add or subtract here? to make this expression a perfect square. So I need to think about that a little bit. So if I add one, then that becomes a perfect square of two X plus one. So if I add one, I've got to subtract one. And now I'm gonna write that expression as two X plus one quantity squared plus four. I think it's important to note that I have not changed the value. I have not changed that expression I've just written it in kind of a convenient form. 
by completing the square. So sorry, here's where it gets a little bit choppy. I'm looking ahead a little bit. I'm thinking about how am I going to find an antiderivative, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to use some kind of substitution, and it's going to be u is equal to 2x plus 1. There's du. And as I did a minute ago, I'm going to solve explicitly for dx, and I'm going to use that in a minute. My second kind of aside is, well, uh, let's see, if I'm going to change worlds, if I'm going to go from the x world to the u world, i got to drag along the bounds. So I need to think a little bit about, well, as x decreases or increases without bound, what the heck is u doing? So I'm going to look at this expression. And as x increases without bound, well, that's also increasing without bound. So as x goes to infinity, u is going to infinity. As x decreases without bound, what's this expression doing? Well, that's also decreasing without bound. So kind of well lucky in this problem. As I bring everything from the x world into the u world, the bounds remain the same. So let's just for a second here, take a look at the indefinite integral and see what happens. I'm going to change variables. I'm going to go from the x world to the u world. So remember, I completed the square in the denominator, and u is equal to 2x plus 1. I'm going to bring that information down. So now I've got a 1 divided by u squared plus 4. dx is left over. That's a du over 2. I bring the one half out in front, and then that's kind of a common anti-differentiation rule. That becomes one half tangent inverse of u divided by 2, OK, plus c. Now, I can, if I really want to, go back into the x world here. But I'm going to leave it like that. I'm going to leave it in use. There's a lot of neat things going on here. So I'm going to leave it in use. And let's go back to the original problem. Here we go. Minus infinity to plus infinity. Brought everything into the U world. Recognize that this is an improper integral of type 1. What do I have to do here? Since this is an infinite integral, minus infinity to plus infinity, I've got to split this up into two separate parts. That's the definition. I can split this up by using any constant. We often use zero, but we don't have to. I'm going to use zero here because I'm kind of looking ahead. I'm using some calculus vision. I'm thinking about what that antiderivative is, and I'm thinking about plugging in a zero into that arc tangent. So good calculus vision. So my two pieces here are the limit as a goes to minus infinity, a to zero of that expression. Limit as b goes to plus infinity, zero to b of that expression. Antiderivatives coming from this piece right here. There's a one-half tangent inverse of u over 2, one-half tangent inverse of u over 2. And let's see if I did everything correctly here. I brought the one-half up front. So there's a one-fourth, there's a one-fourth there. I plugged in the bounds, tangent inverse of 0 over 2, tangent inverse of a over 2. There's the b over 2 and 0 over 2. Let's see if we can evaluate it. Let's see, tangent inverse of 0, well, that's just 0. And now what happens as a decreases without bound? Well, I guess I thought a little bit about what the graph of the inverse tangent looks like. So I don't know if I can do an air diagram here, but as A decreases without bound, as that argument goes to minus infinity, the arc tangent goes to minus pi divided by 2. So there's that limit. As B goes to infinity, what's the arc tangent do here? Well, that argument is going to infinity. As that argument increases without bound, that tangent inverse it's closer and closer to pi over 2. I'm going to put all of this together. I got two minus signs there. Multiplying through, I got a pi over 8 plus pi over 8. And that answer is a pi divided by 4. And that's pretty cool. And I think I can finish this problem with a picture. There it is. This is kind of cool. It's kind of like a, looks a little bit like a bell-shaped curve. 
seems like there might be, for those of you who study this, seems like there might be a probability distribution function in here somewhere. But what we've just shown is that region of infinite extent where I'd need an infinite amount of fence to try to enclose it has finite area of exactly pi divided by four. Now, I don't know if Tom is going to do this or not, but correct me on this one, Tom. I think that if one were to use a CAS system, if you were to use the TI Inspire on this one, I think it will actually come back and give you the exact symbolic answer of pi over four. And that's a good reason. That's a good example of why you wouldn't see one of these showing up on, say, a calculator portion of the exam. Or a student could just plug that into their calculator with a CAS calculator and get the answer. Cool. A little and, technology and, on this one? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, and in fact, Steve, uh, yes. Jenny Nelson uh, yes. asked um, if there's been any problems on the exam recently where students had to complete a square where the leading coefficient of the quadratic was not one. Oh, that's a very good question. I don't know if yeah. I can... One. I think it's fair game, but I don't think there's one been one recent. So I'd be loath to say, well, don't <laughs> ever do any of those. Uh, and in fact, there certainly are ones where you have some function squared plus yes. a constant squared, and then you know the derivative of the functions up there in the, the dx mm -hmm. part, so you can do some substitution. So. Well, Tom, okay. I like your phrase. I think that's fair game. Yeah, yeah, I think that's why it'd be uh, might still be worth practicing one. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, sure. Right. Uh, little, little technology, technology here. Okay. okay. Uh, first thing is um, I did go ahead and make that correction on that sequence thing. It's as oh, you said, cool. Steve, you you caught it. I I didn't catch it before I hit enter. Was I had fouled up the uh, limits of integration, but here's here's what I was after. It was a, an yes. integral from one to n times 100 of that uh -huh. integral that you had. And then I let n run from one to four in steps of one. And then gotcha. that's going to give you uh, four results uh, cool. that are getting closer and closer to, to one nine. Um, so on this particular one, I did want to, uh, the one that you just finished, Steve, I yes. did want to give it a shot. Okay. Uh, use it to make a point is uh, this was an integral from uh, negative infinity to infinity. Yep. And so if I was going to do a, a proper integral as an approximation, and it was one of these that went over the whole real line, minus infinity to infinity, a suggestion I would make is uh, I'd want to choose a large magnitude negative number for a bottom limit and a large neg uh, magnitude positive number for an upper limit. But you know what? I wouldn't want them to be opposites of each other. And the reason for that <laughs> is if my integrand is symmetric, I might fool myself into thinking uh, a divergent integral was convergent. So in this case, I'm going to go from, say, like negative... Um, 1,000 up to positive 2,000. So notice I've picked a large negative number for a lower limit, a uh, large positive number for an upper limit, and then the integrand, let's see, I think it was um, a fraction. It was just yep. one over yep. that polynomial. So let's <laughs> see if I can enter that fairly quickly. 4x squared. Uh, plus 4x, plus 5. And then we're integrating with respect to x. And if this is really converging to pi over 4, we should get a, an approximation here reasonably close to pi over 4. Let's see what we get. It's working away. Oh, that's uh, pretty not good. sure, but let's let's take a look. Some people may be used so familiar <laughs> with the decimal approximation for pi over four. They're already saying that looks good, but let's just check what pi over four looks like as a decimal. 
man, I'm feeling fairly good about this. And again, yeah. what I'm suggesting here is that this numerical approximation is, is really kind of a check. It's a reality check. You know, did uh, it's a way to catch some maybe egregious error you might have made with arithmetic or something like that. Uh, to see if things look well. Uh, this point about a symmetric interval, let me, uh, when I say interval, I should say symmetric interval. Let me just show uh, real quickly uh, an integral that I know uh, diverges. That would be negative infinity, the positive infinity of something like x cubed, because x cubed is going to explode in the positive direction uh, for positive x approaching infinity and in the negative direction for x approaching negative infinity. But if I made the mistake of, say, choosing negative 1,000 to positive 1,000 and integrated x cubed, whoops, let's, whoops. yeah, there we go. There we go. There's where I want that x. Because of the symmetry of that function graph, when I enter this, boom, I just get zero. <laughs> and so if I tried that again for negative 2,000 to 2,000 or negative 3,000 to 3,000, I'd still get zero. I might think, oh, my, this converges to zero. But it doesn't. It, it really diverges because we, we would... Uh, uh, split it into two pieces, and either one of those pieces is going to diverge. In fact, notice what happens if I just copy this integral, and I'm just going to change the upper limit. Oops. Well, let's see if I can. Well, let me try that again. Whoops, got two of them. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can change the upper limit on this one, and then let me go to the one in front and just delete it because I just wanted one interval there. <laughs> oh, this is, you know what? I'm just going to clear that out and try again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. All right, let's do that. And now let me back up. And I'm just going to change the upper limit to one. Okay. And now I'm integrating from negative 1,000 to a positive 1,001. Boom, I get a, actually a quite large number. Uh, and that's because I was using a, a an interval that wasn't symmetric. And now I'm catching that, oh, yeah, this is uh, really diverging in that. Uh, couple of different directions for this case. Okay. Tom, the point uh, uh, moral is on these integrals that go from minus infinity to infinity, you don't want to take a shortcut and do the limit as B approaches infinity from negative B to positive B. You might think, oh, I'll do both limits at the same time by using that trick. And that, that could get you into trouble. So you want to really split it into two pieces as you demonstrated. Tom, would you would you demonstrate one other thing for me? This sure. is, a, I think, a, a, an intuitive thing that students that I would do. Uh, would you would you put in an integral template? Okay. And uh, when you put that template in in the integrand, put in one divided by one plus x squared. All right. And what would you like for your limits? Well, we'll get there. Let's put the integrand okay. first. Let's All right, so one divided by x squared? One divided by one plus x squared. Okay. So the quantity, one plus x squared. And I should have used the vertical fraction, but I'll just go oh, ahead. And that's all right. yeah. <laughs> okay, so one divided by the quantity, one plus x squared. Yes, okay. and then while you're there, you could put the dx in. That's great. Yeah. Now let's go back to the limits. So my natural inclination is if I were given this, this improper integral of, let's say, minus infinity to plus infinity, and I'm just thinking out loud, um, we've done this. I know that students have done this problem before, and they know how to find that antiderivative very quickly. In fact, we've just done it. It's an arc tangent. 
And we know that we have to split this up into two separate definite, uh, two separate integrals, two separate improper integrals. But sort of the intuition here is to take a lower bound and an upper bound that's a little bit bigger than minus a thousand and plus a thousand. Mm -hmm. So my intuition is to take and use the calculator uh, symbol e for exponent, and to use something like one e to the twentieth. So I might, I would put in something like minus 1e20 for the lower bound. So I put in a negative down there. Okay. A negative 1. And then I'd use the ee, -E, which is on the comma key. So I do a second and comma. And then I'd put in a 20. And then in the upper bound, I put in something similar. I put in 1 e, e 20 because, well, that's a little bit closer to infinity than 1,000 and minus 1,000. And so I'm thinking out loud and I'm thinking intuitively, you know what, this has got to give me a better approximation. So I don't know if this is going to work or not, but what happens when you hit enter now? Yeah. And by the way, this integrand I'm not worried about because it's positive all the time. So the yeah. one plus x squared. So I wouldn't have this cancellation effect that I had with x cubed. Yes. So one would think I should get something. So this is this is where you have to know, you have to think a little bit about what's going on. Students have to be aware of this. So that the calculator is a wonderful tool, but you have to use it in a proper way. That number correct me, Tom, that's really close to zero. Right. And so, as you just said, this integrand is always positive. And so one would think that if it converges, it converges to something a little bit bigger than zero. <laughs> right, right, definitely. And so... Yeah. After and in fact, this is the reason why I should have mentioned this, Steve. So people might look at limits like negative 1,000 to 1,001, like I use yes. here. Yes, and those aren't particularly big numbers, right? But they're plenty big enough to get us a, a, yes. a sense of this. Yep. If I pick incredibly large numbers like you have here, you might be thinking, "Well, I'm going to go really <laughs> far out in both." Right. Programs. Now right. I'm running into the precision limitations that the machine can handle. Exactly, and, and, and that's why I'm getting something. It, it's trying to partition up this interval that's so huge. Yep. That it's not getting a very accurate result. And that yep. actually would get a much better result if we took this same interval and for our limits, I'm going to do what I did uh, before. I'll go from yeah, a thousand, thousand sure. and one for I'll again yeah, do yeah, that thing where idea. I won't make it perfectly symmetrical, but okay. just for the heck of it. But this should be something much better. Yep. It's working away. And indeed it is. Ah, I'm getting something closer to pi. Exactly. Right? Yeah, which is kind of cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So Very you good. really have to think a little bit about using the technology here. You just can't blindly do what you might think is right here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very cool. And again, we're, we're just doing approximations to get a sense of is our answer in the right ballpark. Yeah. Right. Yep. All right, I'll turn it back All to right. you. Okay, we'll try. I think we have time for one more problem. I know that Allison will tell us. All right, let's try one more here. Let's take a look at this problem where we have to find the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence of a series. For those students out there who are taking the BC exam, there is generally a problem number six on the free response part of the exam is often a series question. And often, often involves a five-point question like this, where we're given a series and asked for the radius of convergence and eventually the interval of convergence. So, all right, one of the first things we need to do is, and you know what, I always think of this as a two-step process too. I have to take a look at this ratio, the absolute value of this ratio, and simplify that as much as I can. And then I have to take a look at the limit. Students, make sure that you do include that limit symbol in there. If you have not taken the limit, it's got to be there. Okay, can you come off to the side and work with that expression? 
and simplify it first and then come back and put in a limit? Yes, absolutely. But if you start out by doing it like this and you haven't taken the limit, make sure you drag it along. Okay, so what I tried to do is to find a sub n plus one divided by a sub n. So I took a reciprocal and then I did my best to simplify in here before I take a limit. I think I've got an n plus one. I've got an absolute value of an x plus two divided by four. Notice that this expression here with the x in it, with the two and the four, that's actually constant with respect to the limit. The limit is as n goes to infinity. So that actually passes freely through the limit symbol. So now I've got to figure out the limit of this expression. Now, in the context of the exam, I think we would probably, probably just let students recognize that that limit is one and arrive at this limit. If you had to do one more step, and if Curtis were here, we'd ask him how to do this. But what you would do is take the limit as n goes to infinity and divide top and bottom by n so that you'd have a one divided by one plus one over n. And as n increases without bound, that goes to zero and that drives the whole expression to one. So, all right, I've got this limit. It involves x and I've got to set this less than one. Why do you do that? Because I know if that expression is less than one, I know that the series will converge. I'm gonna solve this or maybe rearrange terms just a little bit so that I have right over here, I know that the series is centered at minus two. So I want an absolute value of X plus two on that left-hand side so that that tells me that the radius of convergence here is four. So I've solved part of the problem. I've got the radius of convergence. In order to find the interval convergence, I'm gonna work with this expression a little bit more. Um, the way that I do this is I think about the definition of the absolute value here. And so if the absolute value of, of x plus two is less than four, I know that x plus two must be between minus four and plus four. And I'm gonna sandwich x. Um, uh, Tom, correct me on this, but I believe that if we ask for the interval of convergence, I don't think we took that as the interval. Students must somehow, uh, if we ask for the radius of convergence, excuse me, they must tell us that indeed it is four. Uh, and in some instances, we wouldn't, we wouldn't accept that expression either. We really want to tell them to tell us that it's four, that R is equal to four. Yeah, I think if it was asking explicitly for radius, we would need to see that. That we couldn't just yeah. infer it from the interval. We would need to see it. Okay. So now what we've got to do, what students have to do is they have to check both endpoints. So what that means, I have to take the endpoint of x equal minus six and actually plug it into the original sequence series, excuse me. So I did that. And I did a little bit of simplification here, and I'm left with this. Now, often in these problems, when we plug in one of the endpoints, often with these problems, they simplify to a recognizable series, one that we know converges or diverges. So that usually in these problems, students can identify that and tell us immediately whether it converges or diverges, but they must justify that in some way. So I recognize this as the alternating harmonic series. And I believe we would accept if a student said something like, well, this is the alternating harmonic series and therefore it converges, but it does converge by the, well, alternating series test. So now I'm gonna plug in an X equal two. When I did that and did a little bit of simplification, well, that's a harmonic series also. And we know that that diverges. And so my interval of convergence is minus six to two, closed on the minus six end, open on the two end. And that's kind of a nice place to stop. Tom, is that okay with you? It's nine on the nine. Yeah, there was a quick question about um, um, the whether you use lowercase or uppercase r to refer to a radius of convergence. And uh, 
here, I mean, you didn't declare a letter even in your stem of your question, but even Correct. if it was, I would guess <laughs> that would not be a... I don't uh, think that would be an issue, yeah. Yeah, and That's Mark Corrali came in and said only if they had, uh, it would matter only if they defined R in some other way earlier in the problem, like a, yeah. for a ratio, for a ratio test or something. Good point. Okay. All right. All yeah. right. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks. A lot of fun. Thank you, Steve. Um, we do have some other problems here, and we'll post all of that tomorrow, or we'll get that to Allison and Curtison, Curtis, and somebody will post that tomorrow. Uh, on April 22nd, we're doing a uh, prep for the exam. We've got three really good typical free response questions that involve the calculator that are worth way more than nine points. <laughs> but I, you know, I think you'll find those helpful as you prepare for the exam. Allison, thanks for your help. Yes, thanks, Allison, for watching the chat for us. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and we're good.